Good afternoon, and we would like to welcome you to our online training today. Today's training is made possible by the Utah Assistive Technology Program at the Center for Persons with Disabilities at Utah State University. We are glad that you're on our training today and hope that you will enjoy today's presentation. By way of a couple of uh, informational instructions, we would like to uh, have you notice on your screen in your uh, upper, upper left hand corner that there is a link that says UATP ask a question. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Steve as he makes his presentation, you will click on that and be able to type your question in and I will relay those questions to Steve. For those of you that might have to leave early before the presentation is finished, we would ask you to please uh, take a moment to do a, a very brief survey that's also located in our upper left hand corner. There is a place that says UATP evaluation form. It's a very short survey that will hopefully help us improve future trainings. Approximately two weeks after today's training, the training presentation will be available on the UATP website. We will give you further information about that. It will be closed captioned and you can view it at your convenience. We're very pleased today to have Steve Townsend with us. Steve is an occupational therapist at the Utah Center for Assistive Technology, known as UCAT. He's worked there for 16 years and specializes in seating and positioning, vehicle access and driving, and very specialized workstations. He's going to discuss independent training options for people with disabilities. We're, again, very pleased to have him here, and we'll turn the time over to him. Welcome. Um, glad to be here. And, and I, one correction, it's, it's independent transportation options, independent uh, training. Anyway, um, it's, I'm happy to, to be with you today, and I know some of you, and um, I wish I could see your faces. but. Uh, Anyway, uh, uh, what we're going to do is, I hope, is have a bit of a, a discussion, if possible. Um, so if, when you have questions, uh, relay them to Lois, and, and we can discuss them, have uh, more than just a lecture. Uh, even though I have you know, lots of information to share, uh, it's better if we can interact and, and make it more real to each of you. Uh, so uh, just as an added introduction, you know, I'm an OT, I work uh, as a specialist, uh, assistive technology specialist at, at UCAT. Um, and just for those who don't know much about UCAT, we're a, the statewide resource for assistive technology. And we do equipment review, we do assessments of all types regarding assistive technology, we do uh, uh, modifications to equipment. A lot of times when you receive something off the shelf or you buy something off the shelf that is supposed to help but really doesn't fit, doesn't really solve the problem and we can make those modifications so that uh, it works a lot better for you. We also uh, do uh, exploration of your assistive technology uh, funding options and so that's often uh, a key part of this just to get it funded and we can talk about this if people have questions regarding funding. Um, UCAT can be thought of as a team of specialists. You know each of us has our little uh, ballywick of, of things that we uh, we know a lot about so uh, you know I, I sometimes I'll bring in uh, two or three of us for an assessment that helps uh, to uh, get a, a team approach to the problem. So uh, um, some of my assumptions and considerations when doing these evaluations, I'll just list these and we can uh, kind of get you all up to speed to what, what happens in my mind when we're doing these things for people, uh, these assessments. Uh, uh, one of the first one is that these adaptations are necessarily individualized to meet the, uh, the unique physical and and uh, or physical limitations in their lifestyles. And so even though someone looks like they need 
this device or that device and we think that this is the right thing for them or this, or this other thing is just right for them, we have to consider, uh, first of all, their lifestyle and what, how they're going to use it and what is going to make sense f for them. So we have to kind of keep that person in the driver's seat. Uh, we don't have the position as being the expert. We try to ha have the person be the expert and we're just being their, their coach. A second one, um, the considerations that we, concerning vehicle modifications um, are different, quite a bit different for someone who's going to drive than someone who is going to just need some kind of adapted transportation, some modifications so they can get in more easily. The modifications can be made to cars or trucks or vans. There's, you know, there's been a wealth of, of innovation and inventions uh, over the last several years to, uh, to give people more access to more vehicles. And, and uh, however, there are pros and cons to each one of these modifications. There's, and there's custom applications and modifications that are often required. Uh, assistive, I mean, assessing technology options usually uh, involves a lot of wrenching trade-offs. Unfortunately, if you, if you use a car, then you, then you don't get this and this and this. You, if you have a van, then you have uh, these problems. And if you, have a, if you use a truck, then you have these other problems. And so there's always a lot of trade-offs involved. And quite often, uh, someone's hopes are pretty unrealistic until they, we they have to go back to their, uh, to, home, to their home and think about what they're going to give up to have the independence that they need. Um, next, we uh, find that uh, reasonable function is often at odds with the ideal, what the person thinks is their ideal vehicle or their dream machine. What they want to drive is not really going to give them the function that they require such as what I mean by function is how long it, it, it may be, how long it takes them to get into the vehicle. Or, you know, if it takes them 20 minutes to get in and, and situated in the car, is that really functional? You know, so we have to, to really uh, uh, weigh all those considerations. There's, uh, uh, you know, usually their, their first choice, second choice, even their third choice sometimes is not really something that's going to be functional for them. Uh, they often say, well, it's going to cost how much? Or they're, going to, they're saying, well, I would, I would never be caught dead driving in a, a minivan. You know, it's typically, typically some of these people who, who uh, get a spinal cord injury, they're very macho kids that, who have driven real nice cars and, and or a pickup truck or whatever, and now they're, they're faced with the, the image of themselves uh, needing to drive a minivan, it's, it's pretty tough for them. But that's, those are some of the wrenching uh, things that people have to go through. Um, the other thing, the other big question we always have to ask is why not use mass transit? You know, and so we all have to ask that ourselves. I have to ask that of myself. Uh, you know, do I give up my 10 minute commute so I can ride an hour and a half in the in the, on the bus and save save gas or whatever uh, the same questions that that uh, we face the able-bodied people uh, face uh, are the same are the questions that they have to ask themselves and even though um, you know many people with disabilities for many people with disabilities mass transit is adequate it does serves them well enough uh, they have to uh, they have the same, some of the same problems, or all the same problems that we have as far as uh, the routes are not where they need to go, or it takes too long, or they, they can't get there uh, when they need to. They, there aren't routes in the evenings when maybe they have to long, work a long shift. So uh, those problems, plus the additional problems of, of someone who uses a wheelchair, they're going to be... Uh, uh, if they miss a bus, they may be stranded out in the cold or the rain or the, you know, the heat. Uh, 
for for an hour while they wait. Or there, and there's the safety considerations of, of being more vulnerable. Um, a lot of people tell me that they really can't um, tolerate the the extra stress on their body riding on a bus. You know, that's that may seem unusual or, or something a lot of pe- a lot of us don't think about, but just that bumping and the ride of a bus is just too hard for them. So they, it, by the time they're through their location, they're worn out, they're sick, they're nauseous or, you know, nauseous or whatever. So those things are all considerations that make it more necessary for them to have a car than for an able-bodied person sometimes. Um, the other, one other thing that a lot of people tell me is that uh, if they have an aide come in the morning to help them get up and get going, or get them dressed, or, or uh, uh, prepare their, their meal. A lot of times these people show up late. And so if the aide is late, uh, then they miss a bus. And then they, you know, they miss their appointment or their employment or whatever uh, becomes more uh, at risk. And so all these things are reasons why it really doesn't work for, for a person with disability who wants to work especially uh, to use the bus or to use the train. Um, you know, I often state the obvious, you know, that why not just live a few blocks from, from where you work. And for some people, I've seen that, that they've done that and it works for them, but most people who have a disability, they, they find that that isn't really realistic. Uh, their family, who they, they rely on for their support, may live you know, in another part of the, the, uh, the valley or the, where they, you know, they just can't, they can't manage to do that. And so, um, and additionally, the, the many roles that, that a person with disability may become uh, involved in uh, are as participants, they really, you know, a car or a, or a vehicle is intrinsic to that, or to those roles. So it's, it becomes, a vital thing for, for you know that independent transportation. It uh, it so many times it provides the quality of life that uh, that is required. Um, my role in the uh, in deter- is to assist the person in determining whether he or she can be a driver or strictly just a, a passenger. That's that's a often. A, something that we really have to do a lot of work to accomplish. Um, it's, you know, they come to me thinking that they will drive and I have to show them that that's not possible. Or they, they come to me thinking that they'll just be a passenger and I have to say, well, you know what, you could be a lot more happy, you know, you could do a lot more in your life if you just drove and they don't have any idea that they can drive. So um, it's, it's a difficult thing. They have to, we have to find that point where the today's technologies can take them, you know, where they can go to um, that highest level of, of ability or, or function. So um, we get a drink. Just to structure my presentation today, um, I, I've divided our people, you know, the people with disabilities into two groups, those who will be passengers and those who would be drivers. So uh, I'll I'll just talk about first, I'll group it into group A and group B, but the first group, uh, people who will just be passengers, they won't be able to drive or can't, you know, aren't able to drive safely. Uh, We have the considerations in those kinds of evaluations. It'd be the safety and cost, obviously. Uh, the safety of both themselves and the people who might be helping them. Um, very often, or in most cases, uh, the people who are assisting with the transfer into the car, you know, the, the person who's going to drive, uh, they get sore backs. It's an awkward transportation. I mean, it's an off- awkward transfer to help somebody get into a car. You know, it's, they have to bridge that gap from the wheelchair over to uh, the, the car seat and 
people complain about their back being sore. It's, uh, they complain about dropping their, their spouse or their, uh, their child or whatever. Um, they, it's, uh, it's always the problem for the caregiver. Uh, and the other issue, obviously, is if there's a wheelchair involved, that wheelchair has to be stowed and secured uh, with some kind of a tie-down. Uh, so those are the things we get involved with uh, in an evaluation with someone who will be a passenger. Um, so our other considerations, we have to decide whether that person is able to ride in a, uh, a regular seat, you know, the car seat, uh, manufactured by, you know, the, by Dodge or, or Chevy or whatever, and, or they're going to have to ride in their wheelchair. And the reason why they would ride in the vehicle in their wheelchair is because they, that transfer can't be made. You know, they, uh, it's just too hard to lift, they're too heavy, they, they can't slide across. They, you know, they, so um, the, those are first considerations. And, and it's obviously, obviously a lot safer to sit in the car seat that the manufacturers d designed and it's crash tested. Uh, the, a wheelchair will typically buckle in, the, in a crash, uh, but you know, it's, it's still, these are those wrenching trade-offs that, that I talked about. Um, many, uh, or how many passengers are going to be in that car with them? You know, how many other passengers uh, in the car if, so that depends, or that determines what size vehicle are, is going to be purchased. It's, it depend, it uh, determines uh, uh, how we, what kind of a lift, for example, or if we do, we try to to uh, modify the van in the rear and leave all the seats intact, for example. So lots of considerations there. Um, will the caregiver be assisted? Uh, assisting with the transfers and, and stowing the vehicle or stowing the, the wheelchair. Um, how much cargo area is required? So the, if, the pers if they use the same vehicle for their camping trips or they use the same vehicle to, if it's a, if it's a pickup truck, they have to haul hay or they have, you know, just all the things that people do, we have to consider all these things when uh, deciding on what to recommend and what people should be using. So just to start out uh, with types of modifications to cars, uh, there's, well, the, uh, the one on the left, there's a, a young lady in a, in a wheelchair there and she has a little red car. Uh, this is a, a pretty unique and helpful accommodation. It's called a moldy lift. I know you can't see it very well, but uh, it's a lift that uh, uses a sling. So that person would be sitting in a sling, whether in the wheelchair or in the the, uh, the seat of the car, and that lift uh, picks them up. It has a base right there on the, like on the A pillar of the uh, of the vehicle, and uh, it's electric. It picks them up and and moves and then you can just slide them over onto the, the, uh, the, seat, the other seat. Uh, it, you can see that, some better pictures of that, if that's something interesting to you. It's at uh, accessunlimited.com and uh, it's something for someone who really can't help with the transfer. Uh, they, uh, you know, someone with severe CP, for example, and this and, and you all, oh, and you want to use a, a small car. If, you know that's really the only type of of a um, of lift or device to help somebody get into a, a small car. In the in the uh, conferences that I've been to, uh, they've used a Mini Cooper for their display. You know to show people how how small a car you could use for for that type of a, a trans uh, that car that kind of a uh, transfer device. So you have this uh, uh, lady in the blue, the top uh, center. She's using a seat that swivels. Okay. So these, they have electric uh, bases on seats. There's, a, there's two or three manufacturers. And so the seat will swivel and then come out. Uh, one manufacturer 
seat will work on some cars and then and another one will work on another car. So you have to, we have to just kind of call around. Once we've decided that's going to be helpful, we have to find the one that works in, in the particular vehicle where, where uh, you know, the people have. Um, usually it requires a full-size car or a van or, or a pickup truck. Um, so, but it's very helpful and it eliminates the need for somebody to uh, to uh, wrench their back trying to get grandma into the car or you know, you know or, or a young person any anybody who's uh, having a hard time getting across that rocker panel into the, the vehicle uh, on the bottom there we have a different kind of an accommodation it's they have there's several kinds of lifts that are available on the uh, the rear bumper of a car um, you just uh, it, they're either motorized or not. This one is just for a, a folding wheelchair. But just to give you an idea of the possibilities, uh, there's a, a website called uh, bruno.com, B-R-U-N-O. Uh, they have you know, probably 20 or 30 different kinds of lifts, this, this particular lift and many others, that uh, uh, can give you the range of what's available for uh, uh, stowing a wheelchair. We don't like to put much weight on the back of a car. Uh, if, you, if you have that, uh, have a, a big car, you know, a full-size car or a, a SUV or something, sometimes that'll work, but if you put a wheelchair back there, it's, it's, it's really putting a lot of weight way out and it can, uh, can bend the frame of the car even. Um, but so we have to be very cautious of that. The, the, also, the, the car is out in the weather, and, and if somebody was, was to rear, rear end your car, then that would total the wheelchair. And the, car, or the wheelchair may be worth more than the car. Uh, the other picture there, down in the lower right corner, is a, is a little device we developed. It's, it's called the Easy Transfer Seat. And it's a little platform that bridges the gap between the, rock, between the seat and the wheelchair, um, it just you know across the rocker panel, it folds up, and then you just close the door uh, of the car. So it it's inexpensive. It's uh, it's kind of a slide board that's always there, uh, but it gets the job done for no, a number of people. Uh, if you want to moving on to adaptations to trucks and vans. Um, you see the, the, the gray uh, large van in the, in the upper left corner. Uh, that has a, a big uh, wheelchair lift on it. We have uh, a, a video of showing some of this, but uh, this one has both a raised roof and a lowered floor. And you know they lowered the floor about six inches, and, and then they, they that gives you the headroom. So if you can imagine how much higher you're sitting in a wheelchair than you would be sitting in a typical vehicle seat, you need that extra headroom just so you can uh, get into the vehicle and also so you can see out the windows. But uh, uh, so they modified these vans. It's, it's expensive, uh, but if you need that much cargo area, uh, you know, or, or you have a big family, or you know, you need the passenger room, then uh, that's that may be the only choice for uh, for you. Um, there are seats. The, I show two pictures of the the seats that uh, that tw swivel and and come down and out of the vehicle. Uh, they are often available for the pickup trucks, and. There are lots of types of lifts. This picture over down here in the, in the lower left corner, it's uh, with a guy uh, loading a, a scooter. Uh, this Bruno company, they have uh, lots of different lifts that work in, in trucks and vans. Uh, and again, we have to call them and say, well, we have this 98 uh, Dodge that, and we want to, when we have this particular wheelchair and we have to, Ask them, will it work? Okay, will this wheelchair work in this in this vehicle, and and which which of your lifts? Okay, so the, I might think that the, 
the one lift will work and they'll say, well, no, you have to have this other one and you have to have the, the heavy duty bracket or, you know, so they, they have all these, all the information on these to uh, tell us which one to use. So, but the lucky thing is, um, like I said with the lady to, today uh, on an evaluation, it's a good time to have a disability because of all these inventions that are, uh, that are uh, out there. People are just um, clamoring to provide the type of assistive devices that people need. So moving on to adaptations to minivans, you have uh, uh, the lowered floor minivans that, that you can see there, the, the gray Toyota. Uh, it has had uh, a, a lowered floor conversion, is what they call it. It's been lowered, uh, the floor has been lowered 10 inches uh, back of the firewall and back to the, the, uh, the rear wheels, the axle. Um, and it has a ramp on it, you know, and you can have a ramp that either folds out and they have ramps that, that come out of the, uh, they're in floor. There's disadvantages and advantages to each one. Uh, for example, if, if you're riding a, a power chair, uh, it's much uh, easier to get up that ramp if it's the fold out. Uh, if, if you uh, have children that want to get in and out that door, uh, you know, they're, they're going to want the, the uh, in-floor ramp. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages in the, in the we bad weather. So it's, we want to, you know, if you get to that point where you want to uh, uh, c consider one of those, just you have to become very informed about the advantages and disadvantages of these. Over on the right, there's a, uh, what they call, a rear entry conversion on a on a van, um, a minivan, and it uh, there's two types. Well, there's about four types of conversions for these. You know, ways to set this up. One would be where they just cut it uh, behind the rear seats. Okay, so that would leave all your seats available the way they are in the a stock vehicle, and so you just have somebody sitting in the just in the very back of the van, uh, they'd just roll up the ramp, or you would push them up the ramp, you could, uh, and, and that would be for somebody who, uh, you know, wouldn't really care where they sit, you know, and a lot of people just have, uh, that's, that's the best way to set it up because they have to have all those seats. Um, and you might have it either manually operated, so you just lift the, the, uh, the hatch yourself, and then push down the, uh, the ramp. It's not very heavy, but uh, you can also have it be remote or, or controlled by a, a remote button like the shows in the picture, and that everything just pops up and opens up by itself. You could be in the, in the driver's seat, and, and the, uh, your passenger could just roll up the, the uh, ramp and in while you're, and you don't have to get out of the vehicle. So, uh, lots of ways to set it up. It, it, the more contraptions you add, more electronics you add, the more uh, electric motors you add to a vehicle for these modifications, the more things that you have to maintain and, and more things that could go wrong. Um, so uh, they, they also have it set up so you can cut it uh, and mod modify the van back of the, uh, the, the front seats. So the person could actually uh, uh, roll clear up to the just in back of the uh, the driver's seat. The driver's seat can be on a on a swivel or on a motor that it moves it back. And so some people have these rear entry vans that they uh, scoot up into, and then they make the transfer into the driver's seat and and drive it. It doesn't leave you with much seating, but it does give you the advantage of of not requiring a handicap uh, or wheelchair accessible uh, handicap parking spot. Okay, so they in, they like that idea of being able to park anywhere and and drop that uh, ramp behind them, and they're not going to be locked in by somebody who's unaware of the consequences of parking in one of those 
handicap right next to a, a, a uh, accessible van. van. Um, the other one in the bottom there, the other picture, it's, sorry it's small, but um, I just gathered these off internet sites. The, uh, um, it shows one of these Bruno lifts again. Uh, Bruno's not the other, only manufacturer, but they, they were the first and they have the most um, uh, variety of lifts. But it shows that you can uh, have a lift that's on a boom, has a boom arm and lifts the, uh, the wheelchair up into the, the back of the van. There's lots of different uh, ways to set this up. Uh, but it leaves the, the van without a, you know, you don't have to have a conversion on the van. You don't have to change the, the seats. It's just, it just loads that wheelchair in the back and uh, it doesn't make any, really doesn't change the van any. You, you know, if you, if you decide to sell that van, then, you're, uh, then you just get a new van and put that same lift in the new van. So it's, it's a lot, you know, it has a lot of advantages to do it that way. Um, so here's a, a video of, of one of my associates getting into a, his or getting in, into a, a van. He has a, a van like this with a conversion. Uh, Brian um, has quadriplegia and he, uh, uh, he operates his wheelchair with a sip and puff uh, controller. Uh, he just pushes, he sips and puffs on a straw and that gives signals to his wheelchair. and He's able to get in and out of this tight space uh, inside the van uh, independently, and it's it's a lot more satisfactory to do it that that way than having somebody help him. So, go ahead and show that video, please. Okay, about to get in the van, but we've got this. We've got the passenger seat still in it, so we'll need to open it up and take the passenger seat out first. These are nice. Come out, bad kneels. Makes it. See, the ramp's not quite as steep to go up. Well, Steve will get the seat out of the way here. Typically, like somebody behind me, just to like tell me whether I'm going straight up it or not. Okay. Going off the side would not be a good thing. So you back up, right? Yep. How am I lined up? Yeah, I need to go a little bit to your left. Okay, a little bit more to the left. Okay, now straighten it out. Thank goodness for editing. You could have electric lock down an automatic lock down the chair. But when you do that, you end up with a post sticking out of the bottom of the chair, and sometimes that limits your ground clearance. So typically, we use just the four-point restraint system, and so you just took the four straps onto the frame of the chair and lock them down, and good to go. Um, if there are no questions, we'll move on to to what I'm designating as Group B, people who who are uh, uh, wanting to, to drive. Um, so the uh, obvious considerations, again, are, you know, will the person have safe functional access to the vehicle? And functional is a, is a big word in this situation because, you know, if, if it takes them a long time to get into the vehicle or if they're 
apt to, uh, to fall. You know, they might get themselves in a situation where they're, they're stuck uh, or, you know, it just wears them out. Or if, the, if it hurts their shoulders, if they're getting injuries, you know, micro injuries to their shoulders, trying to get in and out their vehicle, that is something I, I have to really caution them about. And, and it goes under, you know, is that really functional? Um, so we look for the, high, or the lowest tech and the lowest cost driving system. So, the, you know, if we can stay away from anything electronic, we do. But if, uh, if it's going to make a difference one time in 100, whether they're safe or not, that to have electronic device, then we're going to have the electronic device. You know, just we have to be so safe to protect that person and the rest of the public in case of any kind of a, uh, a situation where there might be any chance of, of them failing uh, in a situation. So uh, some subtle considerations that, you know, may be just obvious to, to most of us, but uh, is the person able to transfer? And, you know, in, in, into the driver's seat, or uh, will they need to be seated or drive while they're seated in a wheelchair? So uh, usually someone who has quadriplegia, okay, has a spinal cord injury and, they, and it's affected their, all of their limbs, you know, their, their transfer is going to be uh, a lot slower and more uh, apt to be, you know, they're more apt to, to have a, uh, a day when they're not as sharp as they, always, they usually are and they might fall. And so we have to take that in consideration and, and decide whether they're going to have to just stay in their wheelchair and use a different kind of a vehicle as much as they hate the idea. Um, and it's a lot more expensive, of course, too. Um, well, they ha well, they have passengers. You know, is this going to be just a, a, co a commute vehicle or are they going to have to have passengers uh, on Sundays or, or sometimes. Um, well, the you know how are we going to uh, stow the vehicle? I mean, <laughs> stow the wheelchair. Um, and uh, what are the person's pastimes? You know, um, a lot of people they want to go have recreational activities that uh, require uh, more space in the vehicle, um, and you know, what are the other activities they're going to be involved in besides just work? So uh, if a person's going to drive a, a car, um, fortunately, like I said before, there are uh, modifications to vehicles now that we never would have imagined uh, years ago. Uh, you can see that silver uh, uh, Scion uh, in the, on the left, or I mean on the right side. It's, uh, it's been... Uh, modified with a, a lowered floor and a ramp and and for someone who is small and has a small wheelchair uh, that may be just the ticket for them because it's a you know has good gas mileage it's it's more peppy and it's you know it, it does you know it's really a lot more fun probably than for some people than a minivan same thing with that uh, uh, PT cruiser down in the the lower right um, those things are expensive. Those conversions it might cost more for the conversion than the car, but uh, sometimes that's just what the person uh, is the best thing for the person because of their lifestyle and their their personality and and what you know if they don't have the the need for more seating and lots of those other questions. Uh, that uh, transfer seat I talked about earlier um, is. It, on the left side, it's often a, a possibility for people who drive. Um, and down there in the, the lower left, that's, a, that's an interesting accommodation that uh, a lot of people haven't really seen before. Uh, it's a Canadian uh, accommodation a company that makes a, a transfer seat that's, that's powered Okay, it, uh, so the lady there in the, in the red shirt, she's sitting on a, a seat that, that uh, can, up, can go up and down several inches, and it has a little bar that holds her in place, you know, keeps her from falling over, a uh, little uh, um, 
safety bar uh, across her hips. And then, so she sits outside the vehicle to, uh, to, to uh, negotiate with her wheelchair, getting it in. Um, but there's a, they have two kinds of lifts. One that's kind of an overhead thing that would slide in, slide the wheelchair in. And that would be more in a minivan, but they have one that works in a little Mazda 5. I don't know if people know what that looks like. It's, a, it's kind of a, a crossover vehicle. Uh, but uh, Mazda 5, it has the sliding door in back, uh, you know, on the side there, uh, the passenger door. So the person, such as a, uh, someone with paraplegia, that person can, can transfer out of his or her wheelchair uh, slide that door uh, open in back of them, and there's a little lift that uh, comes out real fast and grabs the back of the uh, the wheelchair and, and pulls it in. And just in less than a minute, I've, as I've seen it uh, done, uh, that person is in the vehicle and 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 going. You know, it's 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 very functional. It's uh, you know a, a little Mazda five still has lots of seating for. For family, uh, and it has you know it's good mileage, and it's not very expensive of a vehicle. So those are some of the options for people who need to use a car. Obviously, a person with disability, they're going to you know it doesn't have a severe disability, uh, and they just they need to use uh, uh, hand controls, for example. They uh, are going to transfer uh, or just put their wheelchair in the back or something. And it's not going to be uh, near this, you know, they won't need this, these kinds of adaptations. But uh, uh, like, for example, this, this picture on the, on the left with the transfer seat, uh, that would help somebody over the years because that transfer, uh, each time they make a transfer that's awkward, it's, it's, oftentimes it's, it's creating scar tissue in their shoulders. And so they're, they're uh, over the years, they're, they're building up that scar tissue year after year. And by the time they've been doing this for, for maybe 15 or 20 years, their shoulders are so sore that, you know, a guy told me uh, he, couldn't even, he couldn't sleep at night sometimes because his shoulders are so short, sore from doing all those awkward transfers. And so that's... Just these little things that can be made, can make the, that transfer into a car more easily are going to make a difference in the long run. So here's a, another video of, of a client we worked with. She uh, didn't want to have to go to a minivan. She wanted to drive a car. She wanted, her personality just didn't, her personality in a minivan didn't mesh. And, and so we, we made some, uh, some changes to her, her car in the back, her, her PT Cruiser, and, and it got her going. So let me. We just had a question from someone. You had mentioned something just before you started into this one, and he wanted to know what the name of that last option was. OK, the name of the last option. Sorry, uh, let's see if I can get back to. Just use the arrow keys. Yeah, OK, so I'm going to go back to uh, was this after Brian's video? Yeah, just, just before you switched into this. Oh, okay. So the last option. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Huh. Um, okay. All right. From the, the with the lady in the in the red shirt. I think that's what he's we're. The, he's, uh, I think it's the transfer seat they're talking about. Okay. You can see that transfer seat at a website called um, accessunlimited.com, okay? Um, A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, unlimited, okay? That's the name of the, the company, and the name of the, the seat is called the EZ Transfer Seat, okay? So I uh, hope that answers the question. If you answer it differently, or ask it differently next time, if you, or again, if, if we need more information. So let's go to uh, introduce a lady named Farah, and she's going to show her accommodation. 
I am Farah. I have arthrogryposis. It's a muscular skeletal condition that affects my legs and my right arm. Um, I didn't want the stereotypical van, just I don't like fitting stereotypes. So I wanted this little PT cruiser, which I, I need an electric wheelchair for long distances because my right arm can't manually push me on a manual. Um, so these cute guys, Steve and the guys at UCAT, rigged me up a ramp and an electric little doodad. I don't even know what it is, but it works. And all I have to do is simply turn my chair on from the inside. I reach my arm in and I let the wheelchair back out for me. It just comes out. Okay. And then I just lengthen it so it won't hurt my little cute car. Yeah. Just extends. Okay. And then I put it to the sixth hole. And hang on, I gotta get my little thing in there so it doesn't fall apart on me. Okay, hook it back up and let the machine do the rest. And we are done. There it goes. Yay! I can go riding. <laughs> Okay, uh, back. Uh, interesting story about uh, Farah and, and, the, and that uh, accommodation we made for her. Um, when, uh, when we decided to, to just modify the PT Cruiser instead of going with the easier, um, PT, or easier minivan, I said, well, you know, we're it'll take uh, some risk in doing this because we don't know for sure that it's going to work. And, and then, uh, and then I got a call when the when the dealer was uh, putting the lift in. He says, "Steve, you got to come down here." You know, and so we uh, we got looking at this, and we and we found that the only way for this lift to work, even though the manufacturer told us that it would work, uh, we uh, uh, it, when we got to looking at it, the only way for this to work is to, to have an extra extra two or three steps of you saw how she had to change the position of that uh, uh, that pin on the the boom of the boom arm of the the uh, the lift and 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 all and and we went through several weeks of of uh, modifying this and when we when the 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 vendor of the uh, the uh, lift was installing the lift in the in the back of the uh, um, of the PT Cruiser, uh, the wheelchair would go in, but there had to be a few extra steps, like Farah showed in the video. She showed how she had to to do this and this and uh, to get things to go in. And and we went for several weeks, not knowing for sure that it was going to work, but I, we had enough to go on to to go keep going and make sure this or to make this happen. And I know, I remember she was saying, oh, I should have gotten the, the minivan. I should have just not tried to get my, the car I wanted and gone to the minivan. I, I'd have to say, well, you know, we can, we can make this work. We can make this work. And finally, uh, with building some things in the back of that uh, car and stuff, it, made it, it finally happened. Um, so we want to go on to, to modifications to pickup trucks. Um, <clears throat> a lot of guys... Uh, in in Utah, especially, they want to drive a pickup truck. It's, it has a lot of utility. It's it 
it's just the car, the car of choice for, for a lot of people. Um, but there are considerations and, and drawbacks, as you can imagine. Uh, there are only certain types of, or certain models of the, of the various uh, trucks that will work uh, for, work with the accommodations that are required. Um, so you, we have to be very careful and, and uh, when someone uh, wants to use a pickup truck, we tell them, well, don't buy the pickup tr truck first. Uh, let's, let's see what equipment you need first and then, and then do this kind of the other way around. Um, in that picture there, you see uh, uh, a lady using a, a device that's a, uh, a seat, uh, an adaptation to the seat where uh, she, can, can, she can move over to a, a little platform and then slide out and, and the platform lowers for her down to the, uh, to the level of the floor of the, the truck. Uh, there's also uh, devices, you know, other kinds of seats that swivel and come down. Uh, if you have a, a tall 4x4, four four, sometimes that still doesn't work. Uh, Steve, we have a question um, that says, how do you advise high school students about driver's education, particularly when they need to get their supervised hours when the family vehicle is not modified? Well, that's, that's an excellent question, and, and it, uh, it, it requires kind of a custom um, approach to each for each person. Let's say a young kid uh, will need a, some high-tech equipment. I mean, not high, well, not necessarily high-tech, but things that just aren't on or, or can't be put on a, a, a driver's ed vehicle. Okay, so that kid uh, will have to drive with me in, in our driver evaluation vehicle and show that there's, you know, that, that he can control the vehicle or that vehicle with the equipment that we have, and then I have to, uh, I would specify the equipment that that uh, he needs for, and the, for the vehicle that he's going to drive, and that vehicle would have to be purchased first before he get he goes through uh, driver's ed, and that's a very awkward situation, I know, but there's no way for that person to take driver's education without this specialized list of, of accommodations. And, and you can, I'll show you some, uh, some modifications, some of the modifications that are required by some people. And that's, uh, you know, it, it might cost twenty or $30,000 for those modifications before uh, the kid even drives. But, you know, everybody with, uh, you know, with sound mind and, uh, and the right equipment uh, are able, you know, are able to drive. I mean, I I learned to drive, and 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 I just needed, you know, regular the regular controls. But you know, um, this kid uh, needs the same opportunities that I had, just different different equipment. Um, the the caveat is that uh, there usually isn't anybody to pay for that that stuff on uh, on the, the spec you know, on, on those kinds of specifications. It usually happens that um, the kid's going to have to just be driven uh, to school or, or to, until, until, to the point where he's going to drive as a, uh, you know, drive for his employment. Or, or he, if he can make the case that he just can't get to school without uh, a, a van, you know, there's, it just, probably isn't going to happen for a teenager you know, to have that much money spent on a vehicle for him or her to drive. You know, I, I, don't, I just haven't seen it. I, it's unfortunate. Now, um, if it's just minor modifications, you know, if it might be just a two or $3,000 worth of, of equipment, that, that's a lot different. But if he's a high level quadri he has high-level quadriplegia and he needs a, a lot of... Um, a lot of modifications of that vehicle. He's going to have to have a minivan. He's going to have to drive from his wheelchair. It's going to be uh, a lot different situation. Is that? I hope that answers the question. You can answer a follow-up question to help me understand better what you need. Otherwise, but uh, 
back to a pickup truck. Um, uh, there are devices that help you get in, okay? And these devices have their limitations, as, as Ken Reed will, will show you or tell you that, you know, it's, uh, uh, if you wanted to have, have a lot of ground clearance, then that limits the, uh, or that makes it harder to transfer because you, that, that seat that comes down and out of the vehicle or the truck isn't going to be able to lower far enough to get you so you, you can make a, a transfer that's easy enough. So uh, there's always, there are always trade-offs and we have to, we, we uh, work with these guys as often trying to convince them, well, you can't have this if you want this. You know, if you want to drive a pickup truck, then you can't have it jacked up so high. You know, there's just, uh, there, it's just a long process sometimes to get a kid uh, to the point where he realizes that there are limitations to what can be done to a vehicle for him. But uh, uh, so Ken Reed is one of my other associates, and he um, he drives a pickup truck where uh, he has the the swivel seat that comes down and and uh, lowers to a point where he can transfer into it. Then he has a, a lift, as you can see in that lower picture, the lift comes around and picks up the wheelchair and loads it in the back. Then he has a top that, uh, that opens and, and, uh, and keeps the, the wheelchair out of the weather. So I'm going to show that video, or Ken's going to show it to you, so you don't really need me to show it, uh, tell about it, because Ken will tell you the whole story. Go ahead. This is the power, this right here is what they call the power topper. What it does is it actually will, it's hydraulic and run. Then this here is what they call the, the POL 1100. It's a, the power lift that actually lifts the chair up into the back of the bed of the truck. The reason why I've got four buckles on this one here is because it can lift a power chair and it can also lift a manual chair. Usually the manual chairs only need one hook and they, they basically will just hook the center of the chair and it'll lift it up. This one here is set up with the four buckles so that you can hook it up on a power chair and the weight capacity on this thing will lift up about 650 pounds. And this here is what they call the tourney orbit seat. It'll power out and then it'll power down to the level of the wheelchair. It's not the fastest uh, mechanism in the world, but because it's so slow, the chains that use the, the uh, bring the a seat in and out, they won't bind up because it does go so slow. Now for most quadriplegics, the transfer into the, into the attorney seat is going to be one of their most difficult transfers for a paraplegic like me. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty easy process. For a quadriplegic, what they would have to do is, is have the, the buckles set at a certain, uh, a certain way so that they could be able to latch them into the chair. The whole time this is running, it's running off the battery of the truck, and uh, it doesn't need a bigger size battery to operate it. But I but I have put a bigger bigger uh, load in this in this uh, truck just to make sure I've got enough power to get it in and out.
with the tourney seat when it powers up, sometimes the door will, will actually uh, uh, you know, rub up against it, but all you gotta do is lightly press up against it and it'll, it'll open it up wide enough. What I normally do is put the cushion on the back seat and then I actually try to power this up. And all this is controlled by switches that are on the back of the door back here behind the, uh, the driver's side. You need to be able to pull your leg inside the, the cockpit when you're pulling in. And you got to be able to lift your leg up to get it over the floorboard opening. And that's basically it. Ken gets to show off that truck, you know, several times a week, and it, it, it's been very helpful uh, for people to be able to see uh, what can be done uh, using a pickup truck. Um, so uh, the next group, or the next type of accommodation, I should say, would be somebody who is going to drive a minivan. Uh, you know, minivans were invented, what, about 15, 16 well, maybe close to 20 years ago, but uh, um, and they're, they work out really well for, for people uh, because we can load the wheelchair in the back and then they can walk around to the, uh, to the driver's position. Um, that, you know, that, of course, that's not for somebody who has a spinal cord injury, but uh, someone with MS or or other kinds of weakness or, or conditions where they can take a few steps. This is preferred. Um, we have even, you know, someone like Farah, you know, Farah that you saw her video, uh, who has, is able to take a few steps even though she doesn't want to walk very far. Uh, those people can, can get around and get into the driver's seat and the minivan is pretty ideal for them. Um, there are even lifts available for the side door, uh, you know, the driver's side uh, mid sliding door. Uh, but of course, if you put a lift in there, then you lose almost all the seats. So it's not, you know, they don't sell a lot of those. So uh, we've even put grab bars on the side of a minivan uh, so that they can can walk if they have poor balance and they can get get around to that driver position to avoid having to get uh, a lowered floor conversion or a you know a more expensive um, modifications to that van uh, the uh, there's mainly two kinds of of lifts there's the one with the boom arm like you see there that lift, that uh, uh, clamps on or has a bracket of some sort a hook and lifts up that wheelchair and then you have it either has a motor that swivels the uh, the wheelchair in or you can push it manually it's they're just two different kinds of lifts and and one works on one with one wheelchair and, and not on another one 
just have to get the right uh, uh, lift for your particular wheelchair and van. The other kind of lift is, is called a platform lift, or uh, the Bruno company calls it a Joey, and there are, there's a three or four manufacturers that have these, uh, and it's pretty handy because you just drive onto that platform and, and then push the button and it just it draws that wheelchair in and into, a, into the back of the van. It doesn't take, out, uh, take up any more room than uh, what's, what's there behind the, the, the midship seats. And so you still have your seating and you have a place to, to stow your, your wheelchair. Um, so there are uh, the lowered floor minivans. Uh, they, they are, you know, most expensive, but they're the best, best deal, you know, for convenience. Uh, you can use either a minivan or they have uh, conversions for the, uh, um, what do you call that? That's the Honda element <laughs> there on the top. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, you know, if they sell a few of those, there's not as much room in the Honda Element, and it, you don't get to have the four-wheel drive that is kind of the big advantage to having uh, that kind of an SUV, but they, you know, because you need the, you lower the floor in the middle where the, the rear drive shaft would be. But, um, you know, it's, it's pretty ideal for someone who's small and can make that, uh, make it up that ramp. It's, uh, the ramp is so steep on that that element that uh, you pretty well have to have a power chair and and you pretty well have to have a pretty small power chair to get to, to maneuver around in that small space but uh, it's more sporty it it's just uh, something more desirable for for many people um, but the you know the conversion about doubles the price of the the van uh, you can uh, that you can drive right into the driver position, or you can park your your van or park your wheelchair just behind the or beside the um, the driver's seat. And there's there are seats that will uh, they'll swivel back and and move back into a position where you can make a, a, a an easier transfer. So uh, and it's the vehicle best suited for someone who needs uh, a lot of uh, high-tech driving equipment. So we're going to show a couple of videos. One, um, first one is, is a fellow by the name of Corbin. He's going to show you uh, his uh, minivan and how he gets in, and, and we'll show another video by another fellow. Uh, his name is Jeremy. And uh, pretty close to the same kind of accommodation, but uh, you can see their different perspectives on it. My name is Jeremy Chatelain. Uh, I'm a C5 quadriplegic. I broke my neck diving into a shallow river. It's been almost 12 years ago. Uh, driving has been one of the best things for me. It gets me out in the community and just helps me live a lot better life. It also has allowed me to uh, continue my education. I finished my master's degree and have started on my PhD. Um, it also allows me to work full time and just incredibly grateful for Voc Rehab's help with getting me into the van and getting me driving. and kind of helping me explore the different driving controls that were available. We decided to get a lowered floor minivan rather than a full-size van, mostly because I am six feet tall, and with a tilt recline wheelchair, I've been in one of the highest wheelchairs, and uh, just didn't have the clearance, the head clearance, to be in another van. Also, uh, as a C5 quad, of course, no trunk muscles. I use my chest strap to keep me from falling out, so the lowered floor minivan's nice because it rides more like a car. And we opted for the Chrysler town and country. The first thing about it is it's all set up uh, remote control wise. I'm able to open the door just by the press of a button rather than using keys. And then the ramp deploys from the side. I have on the recommendation of a quadriplegic that owns a lowered floor minivan kind of stayed with the swing out ramp. Um, fewer moving parts and I really haven't had any times where it's broken down or I've been stranded. They also make uh, in-floor ramps, which are very nice because then you can actually use that sliding door. Uh, we've got a daughter that's seven years old and she can't get in and out unless the ramp deploys, so that is one disadvantage, but the in-floor ramp, I've noticed, just tends to bind up with the snow and dirt and um, 
the one rental van that we had that had one of those, I did get stranded in that, so we've opted for that. Uh, the clearance under the van is a little bit lower. It's harder to get in and out of some parking lots, but uh, we bought a little bit taller rims and uh, put it up a little bit higher. Um, inside the van, they've lowered the floor 10 inches, um, and that gives me the headroom. That obviously is a massive uh, overhaul. It takes about two months to do, and um, mid 20,000s, I think, for the cost on it. So I'll just pull up in, just kind of have to duck as I go, and give you a look at the driving controls that I have in it. Um, I use an easy lock lockdown that has been nice, get the bracket placed under my wheelchair, and then just drive from my chair. And then just very carefully roll up into the driving position. And then I'm locked in place and ready to go. My name is Corby Campbell. I'm a C5-6 quadriplegic. So just a real quick one down. I can't use any of my muscles below my armpits. Um, I've got biceps, but I don't have triceps. And I can pull my wrists back, but not forward. Um, and have no use in any of the muscles in my fingers. Um, so I just want to explain to you my van. Um, for starters, I have my keys on a chain tied to my chair so that if I ever drop them, it's not a problem. There's a pouch on the side that I keep them in. Um, the whole will be run down to my van. First step is uh, I have a, a magnet on the end of my keychain here. And uh, these uh, Chrysler vans are designed the so opening. that there's two magnet sensors and in the, the tail light here. And, and if I wave I the magnet wave over this part, this it opens it, it, and over this part, it closes it. it uh, so if I just start by waving my magnet over there, my door opens, and a ramp comes out. And the van kneels down a little so that the angle is a little less steep. And I just angle my chair all the way down and drive up and drive up inside. Once inside, I can hit this switch to, to close it. But my van has a, has a raised roof and a lowered floor so that I can fit better. You'll notice under the front seat is like a block um, because the floor is lowered. Um, obviously, the middle bench has been removed. Um, the way I lock into place is uh, on the floor here under the seats is a easy lock mechanism. Works, and there's right? a bolt installed on the Whatever bottom of my chair that clamps into that. Steering wheel. So I just drive right up onto that and I'll leave the door open, but I drive up right into place here. Okay, I hope that helps uh, to help these guys show their own ways of doing things and their uh, specialized accommodations. Uh, they'll also show their driving controls in a few minutes here. But uh, uh, going, moving on to the other type of uh, uh, vehicle to modify, a full-sized van. Um, obviously, it's bigger, gonna control, going to hold more people, more cargo. Um, it, they can have a lowered floor if they need it, or they, uh, you know, if they, uh, and also a raised roof. Uh, if someone is very large, they, might, they may have to have a big vehicle like this, uh, you know, someone that's very tall and they don't fit into a, uh, a minivan. Um, we've had to do that sometimes. If someone had really long legs and, and he, he, wouldn't, he couldn't fit into the, the driver's position of a, uh, to reach the steering wheel uh, to drive. So, we, and of course, you, I, we've probably all seen the luxurious interiors that are put in some of these. And but the you know the big downside is that they're a beast to drive and and hard to uh, to fill up that gas tank. Um, okay, we have a video of of our of me showing some of the things, some of the features of of our UCAT van. That's one of these large vehicles. We use it to. Uh, to do a lot of things, but we have um, driving controls in it for for various uh, levels of, of uh, disability. And I'll let them show that video of, of me out on a cold day in December. And I apologize that my uh, glasses were 
were darkened by the sunlight. They didn't ever get clear again. They have the transition lenses, and they didn't ever clear up through the whole video. Anyway, go ahead and show it. Okay, this is Steve Townsend at UCAT. Um, we were going to have Ken Reed at our center who has paraplegia demonstrate this, but uh, we can't get our lift to work today that uh, he would get in and out of this van with. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a Rikon lift that, as you can see, it has a, uh, the van has a lowered floor, about six inches. It's a full-size van, but the lift would come down and uh, he would back in with his manual wheelchair into the, into the uh, lift platform and then ride up. And, and then he, uh, usually when somebody uses this kind of van, uh, they uh, would back their chair into the, the van, back against that other wall, the left, the driver's side wall. And then uh, there's a seat that has a platform on it that's uh, manufactured, and then you take the... Uh, the, the, the regular seat base off of the the uh, driver's seat and then you uh, uh, put this on but the, this platform is electric and it it'll let the seat come back and then it will swivel you can bring the chair around so that the person in the wheelchair can just back in at this position and just slide across onto the seat and then go back over into the driver position uh, so it's uh, for some people with paraplegia or some other kinds of weakness that can make a transfer easily, they can use this kind of accommodation. A lot of people use this larger van if they have a need for more passenger room or you know cargo area. And they uh, well, a lot of these old vans are uh, or these large full-size vans are easier for many people who are. Uh, Okay, uh, just to move on to the actual driving systems, um, just to explain our program in Utah, since we're a, a small population state, we can't have everything for everybody. Um, in large states like California, Texas, New York, uh, some of the others, uh, they, have, they can have a, a big center or many centers where they can have evaluations for uh, people and they have fleets of vans that uh, have all types of accommodations. They may spend a million dollars a year or whatever uh, on keeping those vans uh, updated and, and all. But uh, we have chosen uh, for UCAT to have just uh, manually operated controls uh, and a few electronics that may be necessary for uh, some of the other functions. But uh, we are able to serve 90 to 95 percent of the clients who come to us and who need a, a driving device or driving system or hand controls. Um, and if someone needs to have something other than what we have available here for them to evaluate, then they have to go out of state for their evaluation. Um, so the first type of driving system at UCAT would be just a manually operated gas and brake uh, control that would be uh, attached to the steering column. That's the simplest form. The, you know, they're under $1,000. Uh, you just have a push-pull or a push-forward for the brake and a push-down for the steering column. I mean, it's push-down for the, the, the um, acceleration. And so it's very simple. And, and probably 80 or 90 percent of the people who use hand controls, that's all they need. And so we, most of our evaluations, that's all they, d they try out. They, just, they can handle the vehicle just fine, and they have that put on their car, and off they go. Uh, we're going to show that. Uh, first, Ken's going to show his driving control system, and then I'll show you the, the driving controls that I use, I have available in our evaluation van, uh, that van, you know, the van you just saw. So I'll ha have you go ahead with the videos on those. Then I drive with the hand controls on the right-hand side. Most people have them on the left-hand side, but mine are on the right-hand side because I hurt my shoulder when I was uh, in my car accident. So the only way I could actually be able to steer, I wouldn't, wasn't able to bring my arm all the way around the steering wheel. So they put the steering handle on the left-hand side, so I had full range of motion with that. 
and then they put the brake and the gas on my right hand side so I'd be able to operate the truck. But uh, this van is outfitted for evaluations and it has two kinds of hand controls, manually operated hand controls. There's this hand control over here that, uh, you know, it's just a, another brand. It's, it's a push-pull type operation. Uh, somebody who has grip and, and they uh, need to operate the, or they need to steer. Their stronger arm is, is their right arm, or their left arm, so they can steer with their their uh, left hand and do the gas and brake with their with their right arm. Uh, there's another kind of hand control on here. It's just uh, they're both uh, attached to the the pedals of the you know the gas and brake pedal. This uh, one is a kind of a rocking back for the for the gas and a push forward for the brake. You can see one both of them operate at the same time, but. Uh, so I have people get in and, and we test which arm is better for the steering, which arm is better for them for their gas and brake. Uh, there's all kinds of spinner knobs, as you can see. This one is, is kind of handy because uh, it has buttons on it. Okay, there's a number of buttons. These are radio frequency buttons and people can, if they have finger dexterity, they can actually do their left turn signal, the right turn signal, they can do a horn, they can do a cruise, they can do all these things while they're still holding on to the, the steering spinner knob. And uh, that can, they can also have those kinds of buttons on the uh, gas and brake control here. So, and there are other kinds of um, devices for that purpose, but people uh, get set up in this way for, so that they can control other things they need to if they have paraplegia. Okay, what happens if someone cannot control a vehicle using standard manual hand controls that are on the steering column? Well, uh, what we have is a device like this that's, that sits, uh, that gives them a lot more mechanical advantage. And so if you can imagine, this would have a swivel on the base, on the floor, and this would go forward and back. And this thing right here can go up and down, but it gives you, it attaches to the brake and also you pull, when you pull back, it accelerates the vehicle. So you can see that you have a lever arm there and this person can, can, can get a lot more leverage on that brake when they push forward or, you know, it, and they, they also, usually they'd have no use of their, no, no grip in their hands and, they, and this eliminates the need for a grip. This, what we call a tri-pin can push, they, they just have to get their hand in here and this squeezes it on, on their wrist and they just push forward for brake and pull back for the acceleration. What's cool about this is there's some little switches on the sides, so if they can do pronation and, and supination with their wrist, they can do hit, just kind of wiggle their wrist like that to the one side for their left turn signal and see so there's a little button on the side here and then there's a little button on the other side for the left, for the right turn signal. So they can do their signals at the same, you know, in, in the same motions without any other kinds of, of devices um, required. So uh, uh, this is, there's quite a few people who can drive using something like, with just this kind of a hand control, they can have this either on their right side or their left. Um, beyond that, if someone still isn't able to, to uh, to push on the brake satisfactorily, you know, safely, safe, safely control the vehicle. Uh, we can add like uh, four-wheel disc brakes, for example. That will that will give them a little more advantage, mechanical advantage. Uh, and we can, beyond that, we can add uh, a booster for the brake braking system. That's a little bit, you know, uh, more expense, but it's maybe necessary. And for the steering, uh, the, the, the steering can be adjusted so that, that there's less resistance when they, when they turn that wheel, uh, it, that we can reduce that resistance to 50% or 80%, give, you know, leave a little bit of resistance, or we can just take all the resistance out of it. And you know, we could just push the, one of us, you know, able-bodied persons could just 
uh, turn the wheel, just put, flick it like that and just keep turning. It could be that, that much reduced. So uh, uh, we can reduce, we can change that steering and the braking uh, acceleration uh, quite a bit just with a few little devices. Um, so uh, we're going to go to Corbin's driving system first and let him show what he uses. Get a hold of my keys and just slide them in. Um, since I don't have my fingers, I can't really grab it and twist it, so this is why I've got this bar attached so I can just push on it instead to start the car. And then um, from here, these, these buttons here are designed to, or are the release for the lock mechanism on the floor. Um, there's two. The one on the left is the actual release, and it only works when the car is off, so you can't accidentally release while you're driving. Um, the one on the right, uh, this is designed so that it will beep at you if the car is on and you're not locked into place, so you can make sure you're locked in. And if for some reason you don't want to lock in, uh, but you want the car on, you can hit this button to stop the beeping. It's an automatic, but to change gears, well, start with this. This lever is uh, the brake and the gas and the blinkers. So to push forward on it is brake, to pull back on it is the gas, and then left and right um, are the blinkers. If you look closely, you can see little buttons here that it presses um, to do the blinkers. So, and some people think the forward and backwards is, or the forward for brake and back for accelerate is backwards, but if you think about it, your momentum goes forward when you, when you brake and it goes back when you accelerate, so it works out much better. Um, so in order to shift gears, I just hold on the brake, and on the side here, I've got some buttons that I hold, and I just hold one button until it's in, you know, hold this until it's in drive. You can see it, the red light there, and I can see it on my dash as well. Hold the other button to get it back. Um, in addition to that, you notice the he's got these three pegs on both here and here um, to help hold my wrist in place. Um, so this is just kind of a, a suicide knob. Um, the steering is extra power assisted, so it's really, really easy to to turn left and right. I think it turns at about at least tw twice the speed of a normal car. Um, yeah, from there I can also, there's a switch down here that also opens and closes the door. So when I want to get out of the car, I just lean forward here and hit the switch. Uh, there's a, a voice command system installed for all the, all the other things I need, like cruise control and honking in the windshield. Um, if you look right behind my head here, there's a big red easy button. And uh, if I hit it, it starts saying things. And when I, when I hit it again, whatever it said last, it will do that. Um, for example, the first one, it says horn. You can, if you can hear that. Um, like the fourth option would be the wipers, so I just wait. Or for the washers, washer, and then I push the button. Oop, I pushed it late. But, and that's how I use cruise control and the wipers and the washers. Um, and I think pretty much anything else I can't reach. Um, besides that, all the, this isn't really modified, but I can reach my, if I'm not driving, if I can reach the cooling and the radio and stuff like that, everything works fine. Um, I can just pull my keys back out when I'm done. I'm back away, so uh, that's about the full function of it, I guess. I don't, can't think of anything else, so. Sometimes a person is um, weak enough that they cannot steer using the uh, even zero effort steering using the uh, standard steering wheel, and so we have to modify the steering wheel. Um, this, you know, um, Jeremy, he uh, he used a syst electronic system for several years, and then he had to go uh, because of the complications with the electronic system, and I won't go into that. But he, uh, 
Uh, he went to what's called a horizontal steering wheel, and you can see in this top picture uh, here that it's real small, I apologize, but uh, he actually drives uh, in, his, in this realm in range right here. He doesn't have the strength to lift his arm up to this position and have control of the vehicle up, uh, you know, up high over you know, 11 o'clock position especially. And so he, he just keeps it right in his lap, basically, and, uh, and that he uses the tri-pin like uh, Corbin was showing you. Um, and I'll let him show uh, the details of his system. Thank you. Um, I began driving with electronic controls, EMC is the company. It was all digital, all electronic, just literally miles worth of wire and computers and servos everywhere. Um, that was beneficial to me because I was so weak, I wasn't able to use manual controls. Especially 11 years ago, there weren't uh, many options. Uh, the problem is with EMC, the controls are incredibly expensive and um, the shelf life on them is just, or the usable life is very short. At about 100,000 miles, seven years, they said that they wouldn't work on the controls anymore for sake of liability issues. And um, they won't put new controls in a van older than seven or eight years or 10 years. So we were looking at probably $130,000, $140,000 to buy a new system. So um, a good friend who we've bought our vans through, his name is Chris Thomas in Boise. He owns a company, Access Vans. He is a quadriplegic as well, so he lives and drives this stuff just like I do. Um, he had just barely designed his own uh, gas brake system, um, different than just kind of off the shelf. Fairly simple and uh, very low maintenance, which is nice. The cost was much less than what was available on the rack and uh, very nice too. Um, and then the steering, I kind of had to do a little bit of homework. I tried doing just a low effort steering with the OEM uh, steering wheel, but my range of motion is so limited about the 7 o'clock and 11 o'clock position I just was unable to do it even with zero effort steering. So just surfing online I found that DriveMaster, the company that makes the zero effort steering, also makes the horizontal steering. Um, and then in conjunction with the zero effort I'm able to drive just from this which is really nice. Uh, the way they have designed this is incredible. It is telescopic, it elevates and lowers, it, it can swing either side, right or left. The, uh, tilt and attitude of it can rotate so this is just this the minute we put that in I was driving again it was just incredible um, because of the horizontal steering now without the ignition and the gear selector um, I'm required to use the electronic start and electronic shift I was fortunate though that that was actually part of um, my previous system I've got a screen here left over from the EMC module and it's just wired into the van systems um, where all I do is just with a combination of buttons I'm able to start the van just electronically. That also controls everything from windows um, to the horn to cruise control to all of the HVAC system. The ones that are uh, primary to driving such as blinkers, horn, wipers, lights, we have wired a switch up here by my head and they call it a digitone. As I lean into it it sounds a tone and then operates eight different van systems from blinkers to actually controlling the heater fan as well. So once the van is started, um, then the electronic systems help. Um, I have a pneumatic system on my brake. As I push forward, it just very literally is welded to a bar, welded to a bar, welded to the brake pedal. And then with the low effort braking, even my limited strength is able to go full stop with the van and uh, using the anti-lock brakes, I'm able to stop as quickly as I need to. Been able to avoid pretty much all accidents. The only accident I've been in was when I was rear-ended at a red light, so it's been nice. Uh, accelerator then has a cable tied to the same bar. And as I pull backwards on it, it just is run through a system of pulleys and actually just pulls the regular uh, van accelerator pedal. So it's nice, uh, a difference between that and my electronic system that I had was with computers, uh, I mean anything could break inside the computer, the servo, and there was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't see it, I couldn't diagnose it. Living here in Salt Lake or Ogden, the closest places that could repair it was Denver or Las Vegas, and that was a significant disadvantage. With this, it's just metal parts, and 
uh, whether I need to go back to Boise to have it worked on or just have a friend tighten screws or, or even tack weld if needed. I haven't even had to do that, so that's really nice. Um, the horizontal steering uh, it has a zero effort, and it is just very, very simple. Um, it has a mechanical advantage as well. It's two times around for this for every one time on a normal steering wheel, which increases my strength. And then in conjunction with that zero effort, I'm able to steer as easily and, and readily as I need to. Um, because this elevates, it will reach higher or lower to match whatever height my wheelchair is, and so it was very modifiable for me to get to it. Um, and then we've just kind of added other things from CD players to garage door openers to whatever we need to just so that it's within reach. I've been very grateful to have it. Like I say, it's got a lot of miles on it. Uh, the mechanical system that I have right now that I just showed, um, I've had about a year and I've had no problems with it and have really enjoyed driving with it. So uh, my appreciation to the state and vocational rehabilitation, all of my counselors that have helped me live a more productive life, particularly with working, so that I can just uh, be more of just who I want to be. Okay, back. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, these guys have some uh, very elaborate systems and, and they, that's really made a difference for them. Um, anybody, uh, uh, that's all I have to show. Uh, and I apologize again for going over. Uh, if you have other questions of me, uh, uh, you can give me a call or you can um, email me. Uh, the, the number direct to my phone uh, or my desk is 801-887-9532. And email is just stownsend at utah.gov. So uh, I don't know if, uh, if, we can, if we should go in, if there's any more information needed, but uh, I appreciate all your, your attention and I uh, hope that was helpful. Uh, any feedback that you have, I, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. We, we really appreciate your time and the great information you've given on these independent transportation options for people with disabilities. We'd just like to again ask those of you uh, that would consider helping us out. There is a survey, a very, very short, that would help us in our future efforts at uh, planning trainings. Mm -hmm. If you would go to that link on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, a few short questions. Uh, just a reminder, this will be archived on the UATP website, www.uatpat.org, and you will be able to view that at your convenience. Uh, we will have some limited number of DVDs that would be available if you're interested. Uh, please contact us, uh, and we would be glad to get one of those DVDs to you as well. Thanks again to Steve Townsend for his presentation today. And with that, we will sign out. Thanks for your participation.